The Honorable Kenneth M. Quinn, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs, spoke before council members and guests on April 9, 1992 at the Baltimore Grand. Mr. Quinn's address is entitled American Policy in Southeast Asia. Introducing the speaker is Sheila K. Riggs, President, Diversified Health Services Incorporated, and Co-Chair of the Board of Trustees of Baltimore Council on Foreign Affairs. Career in the Foreign Service has spanned more than 24 years. During this time, he has served in Indochina on the National Security Council at the White House in humanitarian efforts on behalf of refugees at the United States Mission to the United Nations in Vienna, on the staff of the Secretary of State as Deputy Chief of the United States Embassy in the Philippines, and now as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State. At present, he is responsible for coordinating U.S. policy towards Southeast Asia, ASEAN, and Indochina. Dr. Quinn holds a Ph.D. in International Relations and is widely acknowledged as having been the first person to report on the atrocities committed by the Khmer Rouge. His doctoral dissertation was on the origins of radical Cambodian communism. He spent over six years in Vietnam as an advisor and rural development officer and later was awarded for his work at the White House on the Indochinese Refugee Resettlement Program. He was a member of the first United States delegation to travel to Hanoi to return the remains of United States servicemen. At the United States mission to the United Nations in Vienna, he dealt primarily with the narcotics control programs and Middle East refugees. During the tenure of Secretary of State George Shultz, Dr. Quinn oversaw the department's crisis and emergency management apparatus. It is a pleasure for me to be able to welcome him to the council this evening, Dr. Kenneth M. Quinn. Thank you, Mrs. Riggs. I, uh, I thought I had made the wrong turn when I came into the room when I saw a crowd like this and I thought I had perhaps gotten in line for Camden Yards. Uh, I, I didn't realize until coming down here that coming to Baltimore to speak before the council involved elements normally associated with terrorism. Let me explain uh, what I mean. You know how all too often we've seen on TV the images of hostages being taken, blindfolded, manacled, and kept from moving about. Well, that's sort of what they had to do to me as we were going past the ballpark tonight, uh, because I was trying to grab the steering wheel and uh, pull over uh, here, because this is the first time I've seen it. And it's, uh, it's just magnificent. Uh, we've got uh, tickets for about five or six games. To, uh, I'm going to bring my boys down there. But I have uh, one confession to make. And this is really terrible. Uh, but my son is a Red Sox fan. Now I figure if I said that, no matter what I say about our foreign policy in Southeast Asia, it's not going to be as bad as your feelings about my son uh, being a Red Sox fan. Uh, there also was a kind of a question about the dates. Dr. Bird knows this uh, from my conversations with, uh, with him about when I was going to come. And I had originally said uh, the best date for me was uh, two days ago on opening day. And he said, well, uh, if that's what you want to do and it's the only day that you're free, uh, of course, uh, we'll arrange that. But uh, we're not used to hosting events in which the crowd is only five persons or smaller. <laughs> Let me tell you one other, uh, one other story about me, because I seem to have a problem in getting to speaking events. Uh, as Mrs. Riggs said, I was the uh, deputy ambassador in Manila at our embassy there. And my diplomatic title was minister. Now, in the Philippines, minister sort of conjures up the notion of somebody who is a Protestant clergyman. 
And so I got a call inviting me to be the speaker at a breakfast, at a prayer breakfast, and to come and give the invocation. And I thought, well, that's not usually associated with being a diplomat, but it's, I've just arrived and I'll get to know people, so I said, all right, I'll do it. So I'm going off in my car, and it's, if you've ever been to Manila, you know it's, uh, when it rains in Manila, it's the equivalent of when it snows in Washington. Every, yeah, there's some nodding down there. That's, everything comes to a halt, and you spend four or five hours in traffic wherever you are, tied up. So I'm going off to the prayer breakfast. The rain's coming down. The traffic is terrible. I'm stuck, and I realize I'm not going to make it. Well, I have my cellular phone. I pick up the phone, I dial the number, and I speak to the uh, sponsors of the event. And I said, excuse me, uh, you know, it's Minister Quinn. Uh, I'm stuck in traffic. I'm, I'm going to be very, very late. I'm sure the food is ready to be served. I don't want everybody to miss the breakfast. Could you please go in and explain to the assembled audience what's happened to me, and could you give the invocation in my place? And he said, certainly, Minister Quinn, we understand. Don't worry about this. I'll take care of it. So he goes into the room, it's filled with people just like this room, and he comes to the microphone and he said, Minister Quinn can't be with us this morning. Let us give thanks to the Lord. <laughs> so, so you can see I'm, uh, I, I have trouble, but uh, I often can't do speaking engagements. It's hard to get away from the office. But when this invitation came, this is one that I really wanted to do because in a certain way, this is kind of coming home for me back to a part of my life. I spent several years in Maryland. I lived in Hyattsville, and I went to the University of Maryland at College Park. And I also had a Baltimore connection. My first teaching job ever was in summer school over at the old dental school in room 201. And I see it still over there around all these other new buildings that are there. And uh, my first taste of politics came in Baltimore. A friend of mine uh, was running for the Constitutional Convention in 1967. I don't know if anybody remembers uh, that. It was from Catonsville. And so I have more hours than I can remember out on the pavement in Catonsville, going up and down streets that I could never find again, knocking on doors and putting out flyers on behalf of this fellow who ended up finishing fourth and uh, missing being elected. And I was also a member of uh, what was then called the Will Commission, which was on modernization of the state legislature. It was a bipartisan uh, effort. And it took me to unusual events. Uh, I was at one night sitting at the fairgrounds in Timonium, uh, cracking crabs with Rogers Morton. And a few days later uh, in commission hearings with uh, then a hardly known uh, new uh, governor named Ted Agnew. So uh, in my couple of years in Maryland, I packed in a lot of uh, unusual experiences. And uh, they're, as you can tell, they're still important memories uh, in my life. And uh, I just snuck a peek over at the old classroom over there, which is still there. and. Uh, still remember some of the students from, uh, from that time. But in 1967, I left College Park for Foggy Bottom and went on to uh, what I thought was going to be a diplomatic, a normal diplomatic life. And you know, I had dreams of being in places like this, in Vienna, London, Paris, standing around the paratifs, discussing the nuances of international relations. And then uh, somebody said, uh, have you heard about Vietnam? And uh, I was uh, thrown into uh, a year of language training and uh, spent uh, six years of my life in Vietnam and on the Cambodian border. And then somehow with uh, all these different things that uh, Sheila Riggs mentioned, 25 years slipped by. And I still though find myself dealing with Vietnam and Cambodia. Let me tell you where I was a couple of weeks ago because it's an interesting story. We now have a 
U.S.-Russia Commission on POWMIA. And I'm one of the commissioners. And I sat across the table in Moscow, a city I'd never been to in my life, from members of the KGB, the internal state security apparatus, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Russian military organization, and had them tell me and tell the members of our commission about their efforts to see if there are indeed any Americans that they know about from World War II, from the Cold War, from Korea, or from Vietnam. And I never thought that I'd ever have this kind of experience where you'd walk out from a meeting with the feeling that these Russian diplomats and these Russian officials were honestly and earnestly trying to be helpful. It's just not what I grew up with and I think probably not what most of us ever grew up with expecting. And they took us to one of their archives, talk about unimaginable things, into a building that normally is reserved only for Soviet officials, Soviet military personnel, now Russian officials and Russian military personnel. And we went through some more formal rooms, down some winding staircases, down narrow corridors. The farther back we went into these building, there, there'd be only a single light bulb hanging from the ceiling and the linoleum was peeling up off the floor and the paint is chipping. And finally we came to a door, old metal door, they brought out a kind of a rusty key. And here we are, 10 or 15 of us down there, and they opened up and ushered us into a room you can imagine this, filled with what looks like the entire card collection of the New York Metropolitan Library. And in this box of little drawers, if you can imagine, that you pull out individually, there are four and a half million cards on which are inscribed the names of every person that was held by Soviet forces or Soviet authorities during World War II. And they took us around and showed us where they were working in one particular part with the Swedes and trying to find out what happened to Raoul Wallenberg. They showed us another part where they're working with the Finns on many missing Finnish individuals. And they said, in the course of all this, we've come across names of people who appear to be Americans or have some American connection. Some of them are apparently dual citizens who were in Germany at the time when the war started and were recruited and impressed into the German army and were then captured by Soviet forces. And some of them are persons with Slavic names or Jewish religion who had been expelled from Germany and were being returned to some Eastern European country who the Soviet army happened to capture in a camp in Romania. And others are potentially of American servicemen who had been taken prisoner by the Germans and then were captured when the Soviet army overran the German positions towards the end of the war. And they, with a, with a small staff and no computers and no other way of dealing with this, in this room at the end of this small corridor, are going through and trying to be as helpful as they can and tell us whatever they can about uh, persons who have some American connection. Maybe they're not American citizens, but any American connection. And they turned over some documents to us indicating where people who had died in Russia during the war were buried. There's a lot, lot, lot more to go. And of course, there are lots of questions which maybe we won't get the answer to. And I don't mean to say that cooperation is, is perfect or totally open. I think they have a lot of their history to overcome. It's not, never been a very open uh, society for the past few decades. But it was an impressive start and it left a great impression on me. And I'm there in my capacity dealing with Southeast Asia looking for Vietnam era 
individuals. There might be some information about that. And we had people from the KGB say to us who, with whom they had spoken and with whom they had not spoken. What Americans who were, had been held in Vietnam uh, had been interviewed by Soviet official. There was one. And what persons had not. We've got a lot more questions. We, we were meeting today up on the, the hill with the congressional members of, of this organization. And, uh, and we'll be going back again. I left Moscow and flew to Tokyo. And in Tokyo, I was at a conference which is preparing for a meeting of foreign ministers to be held in June on the reconstruction of Cambodia. The peace agreement there which has been put together. And despite the reports that uh, you may hear as, uh, of incidents that take place from now and then, seems to be holding and is working. And with a commitment from the international community to all the Cambodian factions that if you really will peacefully implement this agreement and allow a new free ele a freely elected government to take office, that we, the international community, will help try to rebuild your country. Now, I mention, mention those two because what I want to do is give some sense to you tonight of what I think has happened in this 25 years since I left College Park and somehow ended up halfway around the world. Because I believe that the period we're in right now, 1991, 1992, is the real delineation of two eras. And the past era is the one that began 50 years ago with World War II. And since that time, US policy in Asia and in Southeast Asia has been shaped by political military concerns. World War II, the aftermath, the fear of spreading communism led us to station troops throughout Asia and Southeast Asia, enter into commitments and in fact fight and commit hundreds of thousands of our service personnel and billions of dollars of our treasure in behalf of these goals. And it brought about great divisiveness in our own country. And as I left for Vietnam in 1967, it was a fear of falling dominoes that somehow the communist juggernaut was going to be able to roll up all of the countries. But you're experiencing insurgency and the fear that Ambassador Nathan, who was here a couple of weeks ago, wouldn't have been here representing uh, the government that he does. But the collapse of communism in Europe and the implosion of communism elsewhere has suddenly left those remaining communist countries with the feeling that somehow at the end of this 50 years, they're the dominoes which are in danger of falling. And as a result, the change in the strategic global posture, you're seeing changes in our own policy and changes in our own structure. Now I want to emphasize that we, is our policy to remain firmly committed and to meet our obligations in Asia and in Southeast Asia. But it's going to happen in a different way and obviously with different sized forces. It's kind of the issues that I deal with are such as the closing out of our military bases in the Philippines after a hundred years of presence. But keep in mind we still have our mutual defense agreement with Manila. About the new access agreement we have with Singapore, which just yesterday it was announced that the logistics command from Subic Bay will be moving to Singapore 
the access arrangements we have with Malaysia and Thailand. But things always seem to come back around to Indochina and to what we're doing on Cambodia and on POW MIA. What I want to leave you with in regard to those two subjects is that since July of 1990, we have embarked on a new effort to deal with both of these issues simultaneously and to try to attain the policy goals that we've outlined, the fullest possible accounting for all of our missing men, free elections and self-determination and peace for the Cambodian people, the removal of all foreign forces, this Vietnamese forces from Cambodia, and no return to power of the Khmer Rouge. We started that in July when Secretary Baker stood in Paris with Foreign Minister Shevardnadze and announced that our policy henceforth was to open a channel to Vietnam to discuss Cambodia. And it fell to me to go to New York a couple of weeks later and to meet with the ambassador of, the, uh, of Vietnam to the United Nations and begin thus discussion of Cambodia. And in succession after that, there's been a series of events. And I could talk for an hour about all of them, but let me just give you the highlights. In September, Secretary Baker met in New York with Vietnamese Foreign Minister Tak. The first time since the end of the war, Secretary of State ever met with a Vietnamese Foreign Minister. In October, Foreign Minister Tak came to Washington for discussions on POW MIA, the first visit ever of a Vietnamese Foreign Minister to our capital. And I remember riding in from the airport with him in the limousine and how he craned his neck to the side to be sure and try to see the Vietnam War Memorial as we went past. Following April, General Vesey, President's Special Emissary on POW MIA, went to Hanoi and we opened an office there for the first time ever. And that office is operating today and doing investigations and trying to find evidence about the fate of our missing men. We also presented in New York my boss, Dick Solomon, the Assistant Secretary of State, gave to Vietnam what we call the roadmap. In writing, what our policy is, what we'll do if Vietnam works with us in addressing our concerns. In July, I sat at a luncheon with a young woman, about 24 years of age, who took out a picture put it on the table. Most of you have seen this picture. It's been on the front page of Newsweek. It's been on TV. It's of three men standing in the jungle. She put her finger down on the picture and said, that's my father. And she turned around at the table behind her. Her mother was there and her mother came up and said, that's my husband. That's Colonel John Robertson who's been missing since 1967. And other, the two other families, that of Commander Stevens and Major Lundy, were also there and said, that's my brother. Yes, that's my father. And they said, will you go to Hanoi? Will you go to Phnom Penh? Will you try to do your best to find these men? And I said that I would. And I took that picture and I took all the evidence we had and I went to Hanoi, and for the first time ever, the Vietnamese led us in to prisons to look and see if the reports we had about these men were true. We continue looking for them. There are a lot of doubts about the picture, despite the family's identification, but our view is the families who have waited 20-some years with hope that somehow their loved one would come home, might be alive, deserves everything that we can do to try 
to give them the best answer that's possible. In October, we were in Paris, the signing of the Cambodian Agreement. Secretary Baker announced we would take the first steps in the roadmap as the result of Vietnam's support for the Cambodian Peace Accord. And we lifted the 25-mile limit on Vietnamese diplomats. So if you ever like to invite Ambassador Lang to come to Baltimore to speak, and I encourage you to do so, he's free to come. We also have approved group travel to Vietnam. So if there are groups of veterans who want to go to Vietnam, there's no longer anything from the U.S. government that stands in the way. And we opened up a diplomatic mission in Cambodia, and it's there now. And in January, President Bush announced that we've lifted our trade embargo with Cambodia. And so American companies are now free to operate and trade with Cambodia. And we encourage them to do so. In November, Vietnamese Deputy Foreign Minister walked into the Pentagon. You can imagine he was kind of looking around here for the first time ever, a Vietnamese official walking into the belly of the great beast at which they fought. Actually, there's a good story about that. He was with a couple of other people who have been in the Pentagon. You know, you don't walk straight through the door. You go in one door and you walk over and walk here. And his escorts kind of got a little bit behind him. As he went through the second door, he turned around and looked and saw he was all alone. <laughs> and I think for one second he was a little worried that maybe he shouldn't have done this, but it all was all right. The Vietnamese ambassador to the UN was in the State Department at the end of January for a meeting with us. The first time ever a Vietnamese diplomat has been in the department. And in March, Assistant Secretary Solomon was in Hanoi pursuing POW MIA accounting and continued support of Vietnam for the Cambodian settlement, which kind of brings us back to today. Now, we don't do this necessarily to be, to be nice or to normalize relations. We do this, and we've taken under all, all these efforts because we want to attain important policy goals. And we're moving towards normalizing relations, but as, and only as, Vietnam addresses our concerns. We've taken some important steps. There are a number of steps to go. But the road map shows that we can get there. And if we don't, that it won't be for the lack of effort and will on our part. Now, the other thought I want to leave you with, though, is that, in my view, all of our preoccupation, the trauma of Vietnam, Cambodia, and Indochina, has obscured other important developments which have taken place. I often ask uh, audiences, if you had to pick out one image of U.S. relations with Southeast Asia over the last 20 years, what would you pick? What's the picture? What's the symbol? This is a very sophisticated audience, and no doubt there'd be a number of answers. But very often, the response I get to that question is that it's the image of that last helicopter going off the roof out of Saigon. It seemed to capture a lot about American policy in Southeast Asia. And that image has left the impression of American disengagement, of us putting Southeast Asia back on the back burner, sort of where it belongs. But in fact, in reality, there's been a whole other process at work. The same time that helicopter was going off the roof. And that process is what I would describe as the coming of the information age. And it has been an explosion of technology, communications, and economic links 
which have brought us in closer contact to Southeast Asia than ever before. Let me give you just a few for instances. Just in the flow of people back and forth. Enormous movement of individuals. When I left College Park and headed to Vietnam, there were less than a million persons of Southeast Asian heritage in the United States. Today, there's over four million. And in fact, the United States Southeast Asia population alone would make us the fourth or fifth largest ASEAN country, larger than Singapore with Ambassador Nathan, who was here, as well as larger than Brunei. There are more Lao in the United States of America than there are in the capital of Vientiane. And there are as many Filipinos in California as there are in the second largest city of Cebu. There has been a Southeast Asianization of the United States. But it's not just in people moving. It's in communications, it's in phones, it's in faxes. And it has to do with the fact that the Intel satellite and the Palapa satellite and others were going up in the 60s and 70s. Phone contact between the United States and Southeast Asia has increased exponentially. The figures given me by AT&T said that for the U.S. and Malaysia, there's a 69,000% increase in telephone calls since the end of the war. I think the figure is a little skewed, but for Thailand, Indonesia, it's 4,000%. And the news flows the other way, and it's flowing in English because more and more people are speaking that language, including the 200,000 or so students from Southeast Asia and other parts of Asia who study in the United States each year. And the end result of all this has been an expansion of economic activity and economic relations between the U.S. and Asia and Southeast Asia of unprecedented proportion. On the eve of the Tet Offensive, the United States did more trade with Latin America than with Asia. Today, we do almost four times as much trade with Asia as Latin America. We've gone from $11 billion of trade to $316 billion of trade. The ASEAN countries, together, now account for $46 billion of business with the United States. That makes the ASEAN countries taken together America's fifth largest trading partner, about equal in size to Germany. But think of some of these other statistics. The U.S. does more trade and exports more to Japan than we do to Germany and Great Britain together. Well, Japan's a big country. That's not quite so surprising. And think, the United States exports more to Korea than we do to France. Oh. In Southeast Asia, we export more to Singapore than we do to Italy or to Spain. More to Thailand than to India. More to Malaysia, which is seven million people or so, than to the entire former Soviet Union together. And more to Indonesia than to all of Eastern Europe. This is the part of the story that a lot of us have missed because the, our Vietnam syndrome kept us focused on other things. And the challenge for us now in dealing with Southeast Asia is having spent 50 years 
of our policy to have a region that basically is free and economically active. And having spent billions of dollars and thousands of lives, we appear to be not going to take advantage of it. That our business community isn't as active as others. That we are not out competing as well as we should. And that, and that we are somehow going to turn inward and turn away. In 60, 1967, I got on that plane to fly to Southeast Asia. Our exports to Southeast Asia and to Asia resulted in 97,000 American jobs. Today, it's 2.3 million jobs in this country come from just our exports to Asia. It's where our economic growth has been and it's where the challenges that we face in this new information age. And having created it, I hope that all of us and everybody that we're in contact with will do everything we can to take advantage of it. Thank you very much for having me here. I'd be happy to answer, try to answer any of your questions uh, about any subjects. And... The, the question is, is there a consistency between the information on MIAs, which you're getting from various sources, and uh, your best information? Well, there, there's an enormous amount of information and reports that, that flow. We, from all the reports that we have, all the analysis that has been done, we cannot say that we can confirm that there are any Americans who are still alive in Indochina. We also can't say that we can say definitively that there are not. So as long as that is the situation, we feel impelled to continue. We, we try to get information in several ways. One, from sending people out in the field that is joint teams with the Vietnamese, with Cambodians, with Lao, to go and try in sort of detective-like fashion, start where an incident occurred and find out everything you can about it, either from digging up uh, a plane that crashed, interviewing people that may have seen it. We uh, have just the other day in Cambodia following this type of procedure, discovered four graves that we believe contain the remains of newsmen, some American, some Japanese, some French, who were killed by the Khmer Rouge. This has come uh, to us from going out to the site, having looked everywhere, and at the time we thought we couldn't find anything, having an individual walk up and tap one of our people on the shoulder and say, I think one of them's buried over here. We went over, dug it up, and indeed it was true. And a second, and a third, and a fourth. We have gotten information from the Vietnamese in terms of war records which they have produced from their files, which seem to be consistent with uh, our, own, our own records. At the same time, I have to say that Vietnamese cooperation is often grudging, and I believe it, the amount of cooperation is usually related to how they see our political relationship going. It's not all that we want. So far, we have not gotten information from them which is inconsistent with our own information. But we have not also, we don't feel that we've gotten all the information that they have to give. 
and we believe that they can do better in terms of the remains of Americans who died there, which could be recovered and repatriated back to us. So I, I'm not, it's a difficult question because there's so many types of information, but I want to try to give you a, a feel for a general sense of it. Yes, sir, at the microphone. I'd like to um, ask you two questions, if I might. The first, sure. in the early 1970s, after the end of the war, was there an opportunity to have purchased back or paid a ransom to obtain the release of MIAs? And the second question, a more contemporary one, what is our current policy in the region on arms sales? And policy aside, what are we doing about selling arms in the region? Um, in the, I, I was not uh, involved in the POW MIA issue in the, in the early 70s at the time of the end of the war. I was still in Vietnam. But this question has uh, come up in connection with the Woodcock Commission uh, after, the, uh, after the war when we were in Hanoi when I was along. And there was an inference made uh, at that time, and it's in a book by, I believe, a lady named Monica Jansen, that there was the opportunity for the United States to receive POW MIAs back for a payment of money. And I was asked that question under oath before the uh, Senate Select Committee on POW MIA, and I said that in all the conversations that I was in, and I was in almost all of them, this issue has never arisen. It never came up. There was never any such offer. I am not aware of any other information that's available in the U.S. government that would suggest that there ever was such an opportunity. On arms sales in the region, we have different policies with different countries. We have uh, commercial arms sales. Uh, which go on with uh, Singapore, which involve uh, high-performance aircraft like F-16. We uh, have other uh, say arms sales that will go. We do make to uh, to Indonesia. I think there's some with uh, with Malaysia. Certainly with, uh, with Thailand. Although our assistance programs to Thailand have been suspended for the past year, uh, after the following the coup. With Burma, we have a total uh, prohibition on any arms sales to Burma, and we, in fact, try to have an international embargo uh, against any arms sales to Burma because we think it's a hateful and repressive uh, regime which uh, badly mistreats its people and does not have any uh, legitimacy. We will uh, are guided on our arms sales by principles of not try, go, trying to introduce uh, new types of weapons or arms that would badly skew the balance that already exists. In the Philippines, which is dealing with the perhaps the largest remaining active communist insurgency, one which is targeted uh, Americans, and while I was the deputy ambassador there, the ambassador, I, and most other Americans in the mission were under constant death threat. And we had 10 official Americans who were assassinated or murdered in the three years that I was there. So we provide assistance to the Philippine government, uh, military assistance to uh, help them in dealing with the New People's Army. And the Philippine government has provided assistance and protection to us uh, not in exchange for that, but as because we're we're allies and we're are partners in that. If you have other more specific question about any particular country, I'd try to answer. The the question was: Have the Vietnamese expressed concern about their own uh, MIAs? Uh, they have. Uh, there will be at various times the Vietnamese will remind us that while we have 2,266 men that haven't been uh, accounted for yet they have approximately 300,000 uh, whom, for whom they can't account. They, uh, we have uh, attempted in various times in the past to assist them in that process. 
and we have provided information from our own records, photos, other data from our files from when their people were being held in the South as prisoners uh, to try to assist them in that process. Any, any word of Jim Thompson? Do we have any word of Jim Thompson, who's the American who's been missing in Thailand since, gosh, I don't know when, but he was missing when I first arrived in, in 67. Uh, I have, yeah, I, I have no word, and uh, I think he will uh, perhaps always be this legend of whatever happened to him. And I often go to his store, I, though, for to see the nice silks. At this microphone, I think you're next, Dr. Quinn. Given what you were saying earlier about the domino effect, what is your analysis about the future of the communist regime in Vietnam? Uh, communist regime where? In Vietnam. The Communist uh, Party in Vietnam had embarked on a very significant economic liberalization policy. And that was continuing, and it was influenced considerably by Foreign Minister Tak. And I think that what happened in Eastern Europe and in the Soviet Union was a severe shock to the Communist Party of Vietnam. And that shock was compounded by the events in Tiananmen Square. And suddenly, after having fought all of the wars that it had fought, and having prevailed and having achieved the goal that the Vietnamese Communist Party always had of achieving full state power in the country. I think the leadership felt very threatened and threatened by some new force that it didn't quite know how to deal with. And so you have seen in the last party congress in July not a turning away from the economic liberalism but a balancing and a primacy being given to political survival and retention of the party and control of the country. And they seem to be working hard in their own way to learn the lessons of what happened in Eastern Europe and in China so that it doesn't happen to them. And I think part of the rapprochement which has occurred between China and Vietnam is, comes from this desire to have closer solidarity with another remaining communist government. I don't see myself, from my visits there, the seeds of immediate revolution in Vietnam. So my expectation is that the party and the government would remain in power. Uh, but it's something that a particular generation now is worried about. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, a BBC reporter recently described Noradon Sihanouk as a potent symbol of peace and reconciliation and other observers have described him as Cambodia's last hope for peace. Um, I'm wondering whether you agree with either of these judgments, and do you think he has the will and capacity to reconcile the divisions within Cambodia? I believe that Prince Sihanouk is integral to the success of the Cambodian settlement, and that he will play a role that nobody else in Cambodia, in my view, can play. And my great hope is that the actuarial tables for Cambodian uh, males uh, will have him up in the 80s or the 90s so that he could remain there because I believe that his presence and the role that he is playing in trying to unite the various factions uh, is a very, very critical, essential element to that country being put back together. If, if any of you were ever in Cambodia before 
the war before 1970, you know that it was one of the most beautiful societies, this amalgamation and combination of art, music, dance, architecture, of people, of dress, and what they have gone through, the hell that those people have endured, the unbelievable uh, killing and murder and elimination from the population of however they died of a million or perhaps more people left the country traumatized. And this effort is an effort to try somehow to put this back together as if a, a fine, beautiful piece of oriental porcelain had broken. You pick up the pieces and you try to somehow fit them all back together. It's never going to be quite the same. It's not going to look the same, but maybe we can recapture part of that. It's a ton of money. Go up to the Congress and ask for $250, $300 million for peacekeeping in Cambodia. It's very difficult to get it. But when we don't have strategic goals in Cambodia, we like to feel we have a moral goal of trying to ensure that what happened there doesn't ever happen again and that somehow these poor people won't have to suffer any more than they already have. Yes, sir. Would you comment on your impression of the current status of the Khmer Rouge? <clears throat> The uh, Khmer Rouge are active politically. As always, they're uh, well organized. They uh, are being difficult in their implementation of the peace agreement, and we have complained time and time again. They have said that they are waiting for the full UN body of uh, troops to arrive and for full implementation of the agreement to take place. They, while there are skirmishes and while there are incidents, they appear as a matter of policy to be continuing to support the ceasefire and they have not returned as a organized force to all-out fighting. The Khmer Rouge are the most difficult entity to deal with in Cambodia. On the one hand, all your instincts say to you to repel them and to stay away and have nothing to do with them. And I have to tell you, it makes me physically ill to be in the room when I see some of them there, as I have. I didn't know that I'd have that reaction, but I did. On the other hand, you have to ask yourself, what is the most effective way to render the Khmer Rouge as weak as you possibly can make them? Because after all, the fine, what was considered to be the finest jungle fighting army in the world, the Vietnamese army, spent 10 years trying to root them out of Cambodia. And they had about as much success as we did trying to root out the Vietnamese in Vietnam. You can't get them. And they're still there. And what we believe, and what Mr. Hun Sen, who was just in Washington, D.C., was at the White House, in fact, visiting uh, National Security Council officials. What they believe and what Prince Sihanouk believes is that UN-supervised disarmament and election offers the best possibility for dealing with the Khmer Rouge because it provides, one, a cutoff of outside assistance to the weight of the international community physically present in the country 
Three, that you're going to take lots of weapons away from the Khmer Rouge. You have to assume they're going to hide some someplace. You'd be crazy not to assume that. But you're going to take a lot of weapons away from them. And four, you have the possibility of opening the country to economic activity. And I watched the Khmer Rouge in 1972, and I watched them in 1973, and I wrote about them and talked about them when nobody in this country would believe me. And I'd go to Harvard University or in the government, and people would kind of politely laugh when I told them what the Khmer Rouge were like. But the one thing the Khmer Rouge have always consistently tried to do is keep anybody else any outsider from entering their territory. And this agreement that's implemented is going to put outsiders into their territory. We've got to break open those cells of isolation where they are and hope that the daylight and the flow of information and the free movement of people which has been very successful in undoing communist movements in most of the world, will weaken them sufficiently so that they will not be in a position to retake power in Cambodia. Remember one last thing about the Khmer Rouge. The possible exception of Laos. All communist parties have come to power in Asia through military takeover. That is to say, large-scale armies defeating other armies and marching into cities. We can leave the, and that's how the Khmer Rouge took Phnom Penh in 1975. We want to leave them without that kind of capability and leave them a weakened organization that cannot come back and vie for power. Sorry to go on so long, but it's, it's an important question. Yes, sir. Uh, doc <coughs> Dr. Quinn, to change the locale a little bit, um, a couple of weeks ago, the Indonesian government informed the government of the Netherlands that they did not want their foreign aid anymore because of pressure put upon them about their human rights violations. What is the United States doing in that regard? We are, I presume, given Indonesia foreign aids, and there are a great deal of foreign uh, human rights violations over there, including the Timor incident. The, uh, on, particularly on the, on the Netherlands uh, issue, I think there are significant elements of, of personality that were involved in that. But this is a, a decision that the Indonesians have taken and it has been accepted by other, uh, other members of the Internet, Intergovernmental Consortium on, uh, on Indonesia. It is the, the Dutch, it's important, have not cut off their aid to Indonesia, and in fact, were one of the first ones to turn aid back on to Indonesia. Now, in regard to East Timor, there was a stunning, horrible incident there in November in which unarmed, innocent people were slaughtered where they stood by soldiers, fired rifles and killed them and mowed them down. It was a repulsive, horrible act which deserved to be condemned and was condemned. And I was in charge of our bureau at the time and I signed the public statements that we'd make and I called the Indonesian ambassador in and protested to them and told them how reprehensible we thought this action was. <clears throat> 